So let me begin. So I'm going to talk about, again, the thermal transport in materials at the nanoscale. So as a material science and engineering students, you probably have heard a lot of thermal transport related issues in almost every part of the applications, right? So for example, electronics, the preventing overheating is important for performance and reliability of your devices, right? So you are probably like watching this video uh, using your laptop and maybe smartphones. And as you are like, as you are watching this, watching this lecture, then you probably feel that your gadgets are getting hotter and hotter and because of this, the, the, the continuous operation of your devices. So it's really important to secure the thermal management of your devices to, uh, for the, for to prevent any disruption of your 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 study, right? And also, we have electron uh, energy applications. The thermal management of a battery is a critical for safety. And also, lots of manufacturing processes of the materials they require thermal management to uh, to support to to, to uh, support their cost and yield and sometimes the reliability. Okay. Okay, so before going directly into the lecture, I'd like to highlight one of the applications that I just mentioned, and that is the thermal management of microelectronics. Uh, figure on the left shows the heat flux trend of a CPU over the years. And you can see the heat flux has been increasing very rapidly. And even before 2020, the heat flux is, uh, is already overcomes the, the level of the nuclear reactor. So the CPU is really generating a huge amount of heat flux. So if we do not remove those heat flux properly, then heat will be accumulated in the part of your devices, your uh, CPU, and eventually can destroy the device operation, right? So actually the device failure because of this overheating issue is one of the most common uh, failure reason. So that is an important engineering problem. On the right, you can see another aspects of the processor. Uh, it shows here, this red symbol shows the typical power. And you can see the power has been saturated at about 100 watt, right? And along with the power, the operation frequency is also saturated at about, this is about a few gigahertz. So you have seen that your CPU frequency has been stuck at only a few gigahertz, right, in recent years. Uh, and of course, this is your processors can actually perform much better. It can, it's designed to perform better. And that is possible only if you provide a proper cooling solution, such as water cooling or liquid nitrogen cooling. Okay, so what it suggests is that the performance is not limited by the cooling strategy, the cooling solution of your uh, devices. Another thing that you can see from this figure is that the number of transistors in microprocessor in, has been increasing following the Moore's law. And Actually, this increasing trend is approaching the fundamental limit, right? So in order to overcome this fundamental limit, people have come up with a lot of like strategies. Uh, one, of that, one of them is this, uh, the figure you can see in below. This is the heterogeneous integration. So people put uh, different chips on the same substrate to increase the integration density. And if they even like, stack the different chips in vertical direction, so this kind of approach can improve this, uh, can solve this kind of the transistor, the integration density problem. But in terms of the thermal management aspect, this is actually worse, right? So it, uh, in the future, to secure both the performance and reliability, uh, having appropriate thermal management strategy is really uh, crucial. Okay, so in order to do a better thermal management, we need to know how heat is actually propagated within the microelectronics. So let me talk about that in more details. In the figure left, it shows the cross-section image of the CMOS chip. Uh, and actually this is not drawn in scale, so be careful with that. Uh, at the bottom, this is the front line, front end line, you can see some transistors. So it has a device layer here. Above that, we have a copper layers, 
They are designed for power and signal delivery, and they can also carry heat. And at the top, you can see a giant solder bowl. Okay, so this whole chip is a, usually, this is a flipped and it can be packaged in this way. Okay, so this is a flip chip. You can see a solder bowl. They are mounted on the uh, packaging substrate or the PCB. Okay, and then the other side, we put a bun, like bulk of a heat sink. Okay, okay, so heat is generated in this transistor layer, right? As you operate uh, the computing, uh, the, the data operations, the charge is crossing through this channel of the transistor. So by the joule heating, it generates some heat from in this layer, okay? And that, ki that's, that kind of heat has to be propagated through this silicon substrate, cross this interface, and eventually released to the outside at this heat sink surface. Okay, uh, this is the case of a single layer chip package. If you stack uh, different chips in the vertical direction, the situation is worse. You can see we increase the heat can heat transfer path, right? So heat has to pass through different substrate, different solar points, and then it reaches the, the heat sink surface, right? Uh, all right. So uh, and by the way, after the heat arrives at this heat sink surface, they are removed by the convection process. So they are removed by the working fluid uh, in this environment, okay? Okay, so as a material scientist, what's important to us is to design the heat path uh, so that it can effectively transfer heat to the outside through the heat conduction process. Okay, so we need to, uh, so I'm gonna focus on the heat conduction process in solid components and also the interfaces between uh, different materials. So that is the main topic of today's lecture. All right, so let's first, uh, think about how we can describe this the heat conduction process. Okay, so from our everyday uh, experience, we know that uh, heat is always a transfer from the hot side to the cold side, right? So we have a heat flux in this direction. Okay, and this kind of experience has been described by the Fourier law. So Fourier law relates the heat flux uh, and your temperature uh, distribution. Okay, heat flux is defined like this. It describes the amount of heat crossing the unit area per unit time. And then this is a proportional to the temperature gradient with the minus sign, right? Okay, and how effectively we can carry heat for the given temperature gradient is the property of this medium, right? And that property is described by the thermal conductivity. So if you match the unit properly, then you can derive the unit of thermal conductivity, which is the, which is what per meter per Kelvin. All right, so this is our first like starting point to describe heat conduction process. All right, so if you assume a steady state, which means we have a constant heat flux across the medium, we have constant heat flux, then if we assume a constant value of thermal conductivity, then the temperature profile will be uh, like this. If the thermal conductivity changes for different temperature or it changes depending on the position, then the temperature profile will be different. It may have some curve in, in the middle. Uh, all right, and suppose we have a different materials in series so that one has a higher, higher thermal conductivity, the other has a lower conductivity, that will modify the temperature uh, distribution, right? So uh, still, if you assume the steady state, then the heat uh, flux is a constant, this value is a constant, and if thermal conductivity is a high, then gradient should be smaller. So we have a relatively flat distribution of a temperature on this side. Uh, for lower thermal conductivity side, we have a lower value of a thermal conductivity, so gradient should be larger. So we have a steeper like distribution like this. And the more realistic picture is that at the interface between two different materials, there has to be a finite temperature drop, right? Because everything changes this continuously at this interface. Okay, so this uh, this is really the description of the heat conduction uh, phenomena. 
So as I mentioned just before, this is our starting point to describe the phenomena, but it has a limitation because it doesn't really explain us how heat is actually transferred within this medium. So for example, we want to design materials so that we want to enhance the heat flux or we want to introduce some particular temperature distribution. That kind of information cannot be obtained from this Fourier law. Okay, so we need to go one step further to better understand the heat conduction uh, process. And that will give us some idea like how to design material to obtain the desired thermal transport properties. Okay, so to get some idea about heat conduction, uh, we need to go down to the smaller scale at the level of atoms or molecules, uh, and then we can get some idea, okay? Okay, so here is the microscopic description for uh, heat conduction. And the best theory so far is given by the kinetic theory of gas molecules. Okay, so this is the classical theory. You have probably learned this from your, uh, your chemistry or thermodynamics course, right? So let me just remind you about some important features of the kinetic theory of gases. Uh, okay, so this theory starts with the assumption that the all the gas molecules have uh, they are one atomic, uh, so that means they have only one atom, and they behave like a rigid balls. So they don't interact with each other; they only physically scattering one another. And we have information about their mass, their diameter, and also the total number of gas molecules for the given volume. Okay, so that is our setting for this situation. And then in further suppose these gas molecules are, uh, they don't have an average velocity, so they are at rest, but the individual molecules are in constant random motion, okay? So the picture is as follows. The gas molecules are confined in this container and they are moved around in random direction. So they scatter with one another and sometimes they can be bounced off at this wall of the container. All right, so the kinetic theory really describes the, all the aspects of the behaviors of these gas molecules. And here are some important features uh, related to the thermal transport. Okay, so first of all, a uh, gas molecule possess some energy, right? And the average energy of a gas molecule is given by three over two times kT. Here, K represents the Boltzmann constant. Okay, uh, you can understand this from the the point of view of degree of freedom. So gas molecules can, can move in three different, three independent directions in three dimension. So it has a three translational degree of freedom. And according to the equipartition theorem of Boltzmann, one, uh, each degree of freedom can have uh, energy, average energy of a half kT, right? So combine those things together, we can derive the average energy of a gas molecule as a three over two kT. Uh, and furthermore, from this, you can derive a specific heat. Uh, I didn't uh, have that here. The specific heat is a temperature derivative of this energy, and that will give us the specific heat as three over two uh, K for individual molecule. All right. The average speed of individual molecule can be estimated as follows, square root of a k t over pi m. And then the scattering events can be described by this parameter, the mean free path. Uh, mean free path describes average traveling distance between the, subs the successive the scattering events, right? And the mean free path, according to this theory, is given uh, like this. This is inversely proportional to the, the cross-section area of the molecule and N represents the total, the number density of a molecule. So if the molecules are bigger and if we have more molecules for the given volume, then we're gonna have more scattering. So that will reduce the, the mean free path of the molecules. Okay, uh, the mean free path can also equivalently uh, described by the lifetime of a gas molecule so this is the time between the scattering events and the mean free path is simply uh, the velocity times the lifetime. Okay, okay. so this describes the scattering events between the, the, mole the gas molecules. Another parameter is collision frequency to the wall. 
So collision frequency of gas molecule to the wall of the container is given as follows. This is a quarter of the molecular the density multiplied by their velocity, uh, average speed. Okay, so here are some important properties of gas molecules given by the kinetic theory. And using this information, we can actually derive the Fourier law that I just mentioned in the previous slide uh, at this microscopic scale. Okay, so uh, now let's introduce the temperature gradient to our system. Okay, for simplicity, I'm gonna assume <clears throat> one dimensional transport along the X axis. And we have a temperature profile uh, like this. Okay, so in order to derive expression for uh, Fourier law, I'm gonna uh, derive expression for heat flux at this uh, position. So suppose we have a hypothetical plane of a constant X in this position, and we're gonna count the heat flux across this uh, plane. Okay, so we have the like molecules coming from in, in left and right hand side, right? And the molecules coming from the left contribute to the positive heat flux because this is our positive uh, sign of orientation. The molecules coming from the right hand side has the opposite direction. So it has a negative sign of the heat flux. Okay. Okay, see overall heat flux at this position can be, it will be the sum of the two fluxes from each side, right? Okay, so the molecules from the from the left has carries this amount of heat flux, okay? So one, the individual molecules carries the energy of three over two KT, and here the temperature is the temperature of this position, right? And the number of atoms coming to this wall is given by the collision frequency. Uh, same thing is applied to the other wall, but the sign is different and also temperature is now the temperature in this position. All right. Uh, if you think about the position of each individual wall and these walls, the position of atoms before coming to this wall is given by this parameter A. So A represents the average distance before hitting the wall. So it should be related with the mean free path. And this is actually a bit smaller than the mean free path, okay? Uh, that's because the mean free path describes the scattering events in all direction in three dimension. And here we are only considering the scattering along one direction. So you can think of A as the projection of mean free path along the direction of our interest. Okay, and that correction factor is a two over three. Uh, all right. Okay, so now we have expression for the net amount of heat flux, right? You can see some parameters are in common. And then we can describe this temperature difference by using the gradient of a temperature, right? So we have three over two K font. The temperature difference is given by temperature gradient times the distance between these two positions, and the collision frequency is given uh, as follows. And we can further modify this, similar to the Fourier law, right? So here we have a temperature gradient. So the overall, it, be, it looks like the Fourier law, and now we finally, we derive expression for the thermal conductivity, All right? As I mentioned just before, this three over two K is the heat capacity, right? If you go before, this is the average energy. If you di di uh, differentiate with respect to temperature, we obtain the heat capacity, right? Okay, so this is the heat capacity. Uh, we need to include N here. And then the rest of them gives us the information about the transport, the velocity and the mean free path. All right. So by using this kinetic theory of gas molecules, we have the microscopic picture to understand the thermal conductivity, right? So thermal conductivity of lambda can be described as a one third of heat capacity times velocity and mean free path. Or we can describe this by using the lifetime uh, the parameter. All right, so this is uh, 
important equation. So I hope that you keep that in mind. All right. So what it tells us more is that the heat conduction process, it actually happens as a result of a random motion of molecules. This is in contrast to the convection process. The convection process, which I explained that happens at the surface of the heat sink, right? Uh, heat conduction happens because of the average velocity of the working fluid, right? But heat conduction is different such that the average velocity is zero, but the heat carrier, which is the molecules here, they are constantly in, in random motion, okay? And the net amount of energy flow uh, happens because these molecules possess a different amount of internal energy because of a different temperature in different positions. Okay, so this describes the microscopic picture of our heat conduction. And this is actually the origin of the diffusion process, right? The random motion of the molecules. Okay, so we also call the heat conduction as a heat diffusion process. And thermal conductivity, uh, from thermal conductivity, we can also derive expression for thermal diffusivity. So thermal diffusivity is a thermal conductivity divided by heat capacity. And from that, you can obtain the unit of diffusivity, which is a meter square per second. All right, so that's important. The molecules are constantly in random motion. All right, so uh, so far, this is the, I introduced the microscopic description, which is a Fourier law, and the microscopic description given by the kinetic theory of the gas molecules, okay? And, but we are more interested in heat transport in solid system, right? So how can we apply those like descriptions to our solid system? So that is the topic of the next slide. Okay, so we want to describe heat conduction in solid system. So how can you apply the gas theory uh, model? Okay, so in gas phase, the gas molecules carry heat. So we need to figure out what can carry heat in solid system. So if something, that can carry heat, that means that something should store heat first, right? It should store heat first so that it can carry that amount of heat. In the case of a gas molecule, previously, the gas molecules store three over two kT heat, so it can participate in heat conduction process. Okay, and furthermore, store heat means they can store, the, the heat carriers can store more and more energy as the temperature increases, right? Uh, all right, so we call those like the carriers, like which store heat, we store energy as the temperature increases, we call them as the thermal excitations. So all kinds of thermal excitations, they can store heat. And then in principle, they can participate in heat conduction process. Uh, whether they are they can effectively transfer heat is uh, is another story. Let's focus on the ability to store uh, the energy. Okay, so what are the possible thermal excitations in solids? What do we have? So first of all, you can think of lattice vibrations, right? The, at zero Kelvin, the atoms are fixed in equilibrium position, right? But as the temperature increases, the atoms are vibrating about their equilibrium position. And as the temperature increases further, that vibrational amplitude uh, increases, right? So that way they can store more of the uh, thermal energy. For metallic systems and semiconductors, electrons gain thermal energy as the temperature increases. So conduction electrons can be a possible heat carrier. In magnetic materials, may, uh, spin waves are excited as the temperature increases. So we call that as magnons. So magnons are also possible thermal excitation. Uh, they are thermal excitations and they are possible heat carriers. And there can be a uh, lot of other types of uh, thermal excitations. Uh, all right. Okay, so uh, I just mentioned that thermal excitations can store some amount of thermal energy. And that ability to store energy is described by heat capacity, right? So by definition, heat capacity is the derivative of internal energy uh, with respect to temperature at constant volume, right? So that means 
how much energy can be stored per uh, temperature, right? So if you look at the heat capacity of a material, then you can get some idea like how important these excitations will be in heat conduction process. All right, so figure on the right shows the typical heat capacity uh, uh, data, right? You probably have seen this in thermodynamic course, right? Okay, so classically, uh, heat capacity described as a constant value, but actually they change with the temperature, right? Okay, and actually this heat capacity is a given for the lattice vibrations, right? Uh, so that means uh, actually the most of the heat is stored in the form of the lattice vibration. So this is the most important uh, uh, heat storage of a uh, solid material. The heat capacity of the electron can be described uh, like this. I'm gonna explain the meaning in the later slides. Uh, this is a proportional to temperature, but this value is much smaller than the, the lattice heat capacity. So this is at most about 10%. So this is a typically about few percent of the total uh, heat capacity. Then that's only that's uh, in the case of the metal. For so, so for semiconductors and non-metals, their contribution is almost negligible. All right. So we have a bunch of like different thermal excitations, big but the lattice and conduction electrons are most dominant type of uh, thermal excitation. So I'm gonna focus on these two types in the rest of the part. Okay. All right. Okay, so now we know that these two types can store heat. And now let's think about how they can carry the heat and participate in heat conduction processes. Uh, all right, so let's first start with the electron because the picture of the electron is more, is much easier to understand. All right, so let's think about how we describe metals. So metals, we have the simple model as electron C model. So that model is that we have an array of positive ions in metal and the conduction electrons are freely moved around across these uh, ions. So here you have a picture here, right? We have array of a positively charged ions and we have the conduction electrons freely move around. So these electrons are not bound to a specific ions, right? Okay, so for example, suppose we have a copper. So copper has atomic number of 29. So it has 18 electron here, 10 electron in 3D orbital is completely filled and has one electron in the outer shell of S orbital. So copper can easily release this one electron and they can behave uh, as a conduction electron. So if we have one mole of a copper atom, that means you have one mole of a conduction electron. Okay, so this is the description of a metal. Okay, and if you look this closely, this actually looks similar to the kinetic gas theory, right? In kinetic gas theory, the gas molecules are freely moved around within the container. And here you can think of the conduction electron as a gas molecules, right? And in this way, we can directly apply the thermal conductivity description from kinetic gas theory to the electron thermal conductivity. All right, so this is description of thermal conductivity from the gas molecules. We just need to use the properties of electrons in this model. Okay, uh, heat capacity, I just uh, show you this expression. So heat capacity of electron is given uh, like this. Uh, here, this figure shows the Fermi-Dirac distribution function, right? So you know that electrons can occupy a particular level uh, so it has a probability between zero and one, and it has a Fermi level here. And as the temperature increases, the electrons uh, near this Fermi level can be excited, right? And by the amount of the thermal energy, okay? Okay, so heat capacity of electron is actually described in this way. So among the electron uh, here in the valence band, only a small fraction having the thermal energy can be excited to the upper level. And that fraction is given by the thermal energy relative to 
the Fermi energy. Okay. Uh, if you think about this the Fermi energy corresponds to the temperature of about uh, 100,000 Kelvin, then this fraction is actually really small, right? It's less than a person or one percent, right? So electron, that's why electron heat capacity is really small. If you think about the gas molecule, the heat capacity was three over two NK, right? It was, it has a three over two factor. For electron heat capacity, the the, the numerical factor is really small. So that's why electron heat capacity is, is very small. Okay, we need the information of velocity. The velocity <clears throat> is also related to the Fermi energy, right? Such that the electron, the kinetic energy of the electron, which is half of m, the mass v velocity square is equal to the Fermi energy, right? So from that relation, you can estimate the Fermi velocity, right? Okay, and then we have a tau. So tau has all the information about the scattering processes of electrons. So electrons in metal, they can be scattered by lattice, basically, and also can, they can be scattered by other electrons and possible defects, right? Okay, so tau contains all this scattering uh, information. Okay, so uh, before discussing more about this tau, if you think about the thermal conductivity, this is about the transport of thermal energy by electrons. But as the electrons move, they carry thermal energy, but they also carry their charge, elementary charge. And that charge transport always happens together with the thermal conductivity. And that appears as more familiar property, which is electrical conductivity. Okay, so uh, we are familiar with the conduct electrical conductivity, and this information can actually can be applied to understanding of the thermal conductivity. Okay, all right. So uh, we have electrical conductivity, which is described simply by the Druda model. This is a, this can be applicable to some simple uh, simple metal such as like copper having like s electrons. Okay, so in Druda model, Druda in, introduces the parameter tau to describe a uh, scattering time. So this tau is the same as a tau that appears in thermal conductivity. Okay, so we have a single parameter for scattering, then the co electrical conductivity can be described in this way. So conductivity sigma is the number density of electron times charge square the scattering time divided by their mass, okay? So if you compare these two equations, they share lots of things, right? We have a tau, the mass also appears here, okay? So they should be correlated and that relation is given by the Wiedemann france law, okay? So electron thermal conductivity should be proportional to electrical conductivity and we have some numerical constant uh, L and we have a temperature here. All right, so if we have information about electrical conductivity, then you, from this law, we can get to know about the electron thermal conductivity, okay? And by the way, this is constant L, we call that as a Lorentz number. Uh, this is, it has some numbers and this is the ratio of a Boltzmann constant over elementary charge, okay? So this Lorentz number really represents the conversion between thermal energy represented by the Boltzmann number, the Boltzmann constant, and the, the elementary charge. This is a conversion factor for thermal energy and the charge. All right, so a uh, description of electron thermal conductivity is a kind of a simple, right? You can directly apply the, the, the kinetic as a theory to the electrons, right? Okay, so that was a straightforward. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, next, we have the lattice vibrations, which store most of the thermal energy in the solar system. Okay, so how can we describe these lattice vibrations? So that's uh, not that uh, straightforward, right? Okay, so let's just start with how can we describe the vibration themselves? Okay, so suppose we have a crystalline solid consisting of n number of atoms. So the atoms are uh, 
arranged in this periodic uh, structure. Uh, suppose I have a different color, but suppose they are all identical atoms. Okay. In order to describe the vibrational motion, we need to describe the displacement of atoms in three dimensions, right? So we need to know how these atoms are, how this atom moves in X and Y and Z axis, right? Okay, so that means this vibrational motion requires a degrees of freedom of three times n, right? The n atom in three dimensions, okay? So this description can be given in the real space by using the x, y, and x, y, and z as a variable. But this equivalent information can be given by the properties of the wave functions, right? So you can think of this as a Fourier transform. So the information of the displacement in real space can be equivalently given by the properties of the sine functions or oscillators, okay, in this way. And then the useful parameter now is the wave vector k. A wave vector is a 2 pi over the wavelength along that particular direction. Since we have, uh, we consider three dimensions, so it has three components, so it appears uh, as a vector. Okay. So uh, from now on, I'm gonna describe the lattice vibration in terms of the behaviors of oscillators. So this is a lattice vibration. Uh, this is not from per for the particular individual atom. Instead, this is a collective motion that's, that extends over the entire crystals. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna describe in terms of the oscillator. Next step is how can we describe this oscillator? So this vibrational motion happens at the atomic level, which means this is much smaller than continuous scale. And then we need to consider the quantum mechanical behavior. Okay, so that's a bit more complicated than electrons, right? Uh, all right, so we have a uh, 3N number of oscillators before, uh, like dealing with a bunch of oscillator, let's think about how a single oscillator behave, okay? Okay, the harmonic oscillator basically is described as follows. We have a mass attached to a wall by a spring. We know the spring constant and we know the mass and we describe the motion of the mass by using this displacement of parameter. And here the mass uh, experience of force that is the spring constant times the displacement. And then it has the potential energy, which is a half of kx squared. So this is a quadratic term. So this is the harmonic potential energy of this oscillator. And furthermore, uh, this oscillator can show the resonant frequency determined by the spring constant and the mass, right? Okay. So this is uh, actually a classical description. So classically, we have force, we have potential energy. The mass can have any position in this area, right? It can continuously have any position here. And then that means the energy is also continuous. But if you focus on the quantum level, now the situation is a bit different, right? Okay, so in order to describe the behaviors of the quantum harmonic oscillator, we need to solve the Schrodinger equation, right? This is Schrodinger equation. You plug in the potential energy here, then you can derive, you can obtain expression for the basic wave function and the possible energy states, right? Okay, so the Schrodinger equation for quantum harmonic oscillator is probably one of the few problems that you can solve uh, using your hands, right? You probably have seen this in modern physics class. Uh, it's just still a bit complicated. You need to introduce the letter operator. It's really demanding. Okay, so let me jump all the derivation, uh, skip all the derivation, and jump to the conclusion. Okay, so quantum harmonic oscillator shows uh, energy level as follows. Okay, so in classical regime, it shows continuous harmonic energy, but in quantum level, the energy is not continuous anymore, but it has a discrete energy level. And that energy level is given uh, like this. Okay, so the important features of the quantum harmonic oscillator is that the energy levels are quantized. This is the same for any quantum mechanical behavior, any, part any different particles. 
And then it has a zero point energy. You can see a half of h bar omega has a zero point energy here. And the most significant feature of the quantum harmonic oscillator is that the energy levels are equally spaced. You can see their steps are equal, and that step is given as h bar omega. Okay, so you can think of this h bar omega is really the basic unit of energy of this harmonic oscillator, right? Okay. So if you think about the energy distribution, when temperature is zero, zero Kelvin, it should occupy the lowest energy, which is a zero point energy. And as the temperature increases, it can possess a higher energy level, right? Okay, so the expectation number for this energy level can be given uh, as follows. You can easily derive this expression, by the way, okay. Okay, so this expectation number for N is determined by a temperature in your energy unit, okay? So that means at the given temperature, like uh, how much of that energy level that you can have energy, the unit you have uh, in this system. Uh, all right, so that is the basic properties of a single harmonic oscillator. So if we apply this to our crystalline solid, which has a bunch of harmonic oscillators, this basic feature still hold for the solid system. Okay, so for solid, still we have energy, the energy are quantized, and that energy quantum uh, is given by h bar omega. And this is what we call as a phonons. So phonon is defined as the energy quantum of uh, of the lattice vibrations okay so that is important concept uh, all right okay so this is a behavior of a single harmonic oscillator then if we want to extend this to the crystalline solid having a bunch of oscillators how can you describe their behaviors okay that is not a single simple problem right so the great science, the great physicist Einstein come up with this idea. He actually is actually the one who first applied the concept of energy quantum to this lattice vibrations. Okay, so what Einstein did is that he assumed these oscillators are independent and they all have the same frequency. And we call that as uh, Einstein frequency, right? So by using this model, Einstein can successfully describe the heat capacity, right? So he successfully described the behaviors at the very low temperature, okay? But still, there was some discrepancy, right? And that discrepancy is solved by another physicist, uh, Debye, uh, five years after. Okay, so Einstein assumes a single frequency for all of the harmonic oscillators in lattice uh, in the solar system, but Debye, uh, Debye uh, suggested this idea that these oscillators are not actually independent to one another. They are actually re related, and the frequency is actually not a single value, but instead it has certain spectrum. So it starts from zero and it has some number. It has some cutoff frequency and that's a given by the divide frequency, right? And furthermore, uh, divide suggested that the frequency is linear with the, the magnitude of the wave vector. So this is typical relation that you can observe from the acoustic waves. So divide really uh, combined those ideas and suggested the model for uh, this crystalline solid. And that actually, quite perfectly describe the, the heat capacity behaviors, right? All right, so that's now the picture, how you can describe the oscillator to describe the lattice vibrations. All right, so here are some important, so here are our descriptors to, for the oscillators of the crystalline solid. So instead of the position variable, we use the wave vector, right? And from the wave vector, you can determine appropriate frequency, right? So Debye suggested the linear uh, relation, but actually this relation is much more complicated, right? And then we have another, we need another property that is density of states. That means how many wave vectors can have the same uh, energy level or same frequency, okay? And then furthermore, we have distribution function, Bose-Einstein function, 
which describes the occupation number for a particular frequency. And it's given as follows. And as you can see, this is identical to the expectation number of the phonons the, that we see for a single harmonic oscillator. Okay, so this distribution function really tells you like how many phonons you have at this particular frequency. Okay. Uh, this figure shows the dispersion and density of states of a silicon. You can see uh, here the y-axis is a frequency, x-axis is a wave vector. You can see their relation is linear only at the very small energy level, right? And they have some curve. It's almost flat for the high uh, frequency level. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna. Not, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm not going to cover all the details. Well, let me just introduce the concepts, and you can later find some other textbooks, and you can easily find descriptions for these parameters, these properties. All right. Okay. So I introduce how we can describe lattice vibrations. Okay, so the important topic that we have is to describe the thermal conductivity. So how can we describe thermal conductivity? We only have the kinetic gas theory, but here we have some like wave pictures for lattice vibrations. So how can you apply those to the kinetic gas theory? Okay, so the thing is, you can we know that the energy has a quanta there, which is a phonon. And then the thing is, you can treat the phonons as a particles. So phonons can be compared as an analog of the, the gas molecule, individual gas molecules. So you can think of the gas molecule as a phonons. Okay? So in kinetic gas theory, gas molecules possess energy. They travel freely around, scatter with each other. The phonon behaves exactly the same uh, way. Okay. Okay, so you may wonder at this point that so far I have described the lattice vibration as a wave, and now all of a sudden I changed the picture as a particle, right? So how is that possible? So uh, another useful like, like way to understand phonon is that the phonons have lots of things in common with the photons. The photon is the energy quanta of light, right? So in for photons, you know that photons have the, the wave and particle duality. Sometimes they can be described as waves, and sometimes they describe as a particle, such as in the photoelectric effect. The same thing happens in for phonons. You can it has the wave nature and also the particle nature. All right. Okay, so now you can think of phonon as a particles moving around in the solid. And then you can apply the properties of phonon to describe the phonon thermal conductivity. But in gas molecule, they have a single parameter, but for phonons, it has a spectrum of a frequency. So you need to think about the integration over the phonon frequency. So this is the expression for the phonon thermal conductivity. Right. Uh, and here I have a summation additional. Initially, it describes the vibrational direction in three dimensions. So it describes the polarization of lattice vibration. Okay, so here this is the heat capacity given by the energy quanta and distribution function. Only this one has a uh, temperature dependence. So we have a derivative here, and this is density of states. Uh, velocity is a given from the dispersion relation, relation between frequency and wave vector. And now we have mean free path. The phonon mean free path related to the scattering of phonons, and phonons can be scattered by another phonon, electrons, and some extrinsic defects. Okay. Okay. So this is the important part that uh, to understand the phonon thermal conductivity. Okay. All right, so let me talk more about this the phonon scattering events. Okay. Oh, all right, so phonon phonon scattering. This is the intrinsic phonon scattering mechanism. This is present in all of the solid. Okay. Okay, so far I have assumed the harmonic system, right? Harmonic potential. And actually, in harmonic system, the phonon scattering is not possible. Okay. So here I have a picture of the pond issues a uh, water waves at the surface, right? Suppose you have a two water waves at the surface and as they propagate, they overlap and their amplitude, as you can see here, 
their amplitude is simply the sum of the amplitude of individual waves, right? So here, you can simply apply the superposition principle for harmonic system. So that means when two lattice waves are overlapping, uh, they don't interact with each other and just propagate on uh, along the direction they, they wanted, right? So in order to have some scattering between phonons, we need to consider the deviation from harmonic potential, okay? Okay, so actually the potential energy of the atoms is not harmonic, right? This is one model to represent the inner atomic potential, right? So this is equilibrium position. You can see as atoms are getting closer, they have repulsive force. As they are far apart, they have attractive force, right? Uh, near the equilibrium, we can assume as uh, uh, this as a harmonic potential, but as temperature increases and as the energy increases, you can see a deviation from this uh, harmonic description, right? Right. So if the potential energy is not harmonic, that means now the potential energy has a higher order terms in addition to the quadratic terms. And that means you have also additional force on the, the atomic vibrations, right? Okay, so in this regime, uh, where we have the anharmonicity, uh, then when two waves are overlapping, they interact with each other. So their, the vibrational amplitude is not simply a sum, it has some more nonlinear interactions. So that will modify the total uh, amplitude. And that results in the interaction of the phonon scattering. Okay. Okay, so here we have the possible phonon scattering mechanisms. Uh, here you have the two incoming phonons. Uh, if we don't have the unharmonic potential, after this scattering, they will just propagate in in the same direction. Okay. So there will be no interaction. But if we have nonlinear uh nonlinear force between them, after scattering, they can be combined and they can uh, generate additional like third type of phonons, okay? So we call this as a three phonon scattering, okay? Okay, uh, all right, so this is a possible phonon scattering. Another type is that when the K vector, the wave vectors are large, they can generate a huge uh, vector that is it coming out of this first to Brillouin zone. Uh, I haven't mentioned about the Brillouin zone concept, but you can think of this as the unicell in the reciprocal lattice. Okay, so if the wave vector goes outside of the Brillouin zone, the same information can be described by another vector within the Brillouin zone. Okay, so it can be uh, transferred by the reciprocal lattice vector. Right. Okay. So what it says is what it says in this slide is that the interaction of the two wave vector generates another phonon that's propagating in the opposite direction. So this will create some resistance. So eventually it explains the, uh, the thermal conductivity. Okay, uh, we distinguish these two processes here. It doesn't generate uh, the opposite direction wave vector, right? So this is, we call normal scattering. This type is unclapped scattering. Okay, so this is a dominant like, mechanism for the phonon resistance. Right, so these uh, phonons are scattered in this way from this unharmonic potential of the uh, crystal. And then there, uh, the scattering events uh, are described by the mean free path. And here is some example of the mean free path of a typical uh, materials. Okay, so a phonon mean free path, which is a travel distance between scattering events, is actually quite long. Uh, this is much longer if you compare the electron mean free path in metals. Okay, so here you can see the in the case of uh, diamond, the mean free path uh, ranges from uh, ranges from nanometer up to about 100, 100 micron. Okay. Uh, similar to silicon and silicon and gallium arsenide, some other semiconductors. Okay, so what it means is that uh, mean free path is pretty long, and if you make the material like smaller than this size, then you're gonna actually uh, introduce another scattering mechanism, which will lower the uh, thermal conductivity. So that's actually another problem of thermal management of a small 
uh, materials. All right, so uh, so those are the basic <clears throat> explanations for thermal conductivity. We know how to describe electron and phonon thermal conductivity now. So let's combine them to understand the general thermal conductivity of the materials. Okay, so for metals, it has two contribution from electrons and phonons, but for most of the metal, the electron conductivity is dominant over phonon conductivity, uh, right? So, and, and this conductivity is described by electrical conductivity, right? For non-metal, where electronic contribution is negligible, the phonon thermal conductivity is given like this from the kinetic theory, right? Okay, so the figure on the right shows the typical thermal conductivity of the solids, okay? Uh, if you look at the silicon here, you can see it should, this is a temperature dependence. At the very low temperature, the K vector, the wave vector is not long enough to create some significant phonon scattering. So at the very low temperature, it's dominated by the heat capacity behavior, which is a proportional to temperature Q. And at the very high temperature, now as the temperature increases, thermal conductivity decreases because of, because now we are having more of the phonon scatterings. So this is a typical behavior of a thermal conductivity, increase and then decrease. Okay? Uh, here we have the copper thermal conductivity at the lower temperature, it shows the temperature dependence of electron heat capacity, right? Okay, on the lower side, you can see some other types of materials such as alloy and some disorder, like amorphous materials. And their temperature dependence is quite different. That's because for this disorder materials, it's not easy to define uh, lattice waves, right? So they require actually a different description. So that's actually a very important research topic. And we are still, uh, it's uh, important and we need to uh, find, uh, we need to develop some a better like model to describe the behavior of disorder materials. Okay, so this is a typical behavior. The figure on the right shows the thermal conductivity of a silicon, the same material, but you can see the behaviors change depending on the shape and composition. So here, if you further purify for element, for different element, like, like isotope element, you can further enhance the thermal conductivity. If you make silicon like small size, like nanowire or nanograin, then the conductivity decreases very significantly. Uh, all right. Okay, so uh, so far is really the fundamental aspects that I want to like show you about the thermal conductivity of the solids. So we start with the Fourier law and the kinetic acid theory, and I wanna I wanted to show you that the thermal conductivity of a solid can be described in a coherent picture given by the kinetic uh, gas theory. Right. So electron and phonons can be described in the same uh, framework. Okay, so I believe that's really the basic like understanding to understand more complicated behaviors of a thermal conductivity of a various materials. Okay, so those are the theories, and let me move on to some research part. Okay, so for design of the thermal management, like better thermal management, we need to find a material that has a higher thermal conductivity, right? So that is a given, <clears throat> like this. Okay. okay, so let's uh, here, uh, let me introduce some classical guideline for uh, high thermal conductivity material. Uh, for electron conductivity, you can just find a high electrical conductivity material, right? So that will give you the high electron conductivity. For the phonons, it's actually not very straightforward, right? Uh, the heat capacity and growth velocities are rather a similar order for many of the material. So the mean free path is the most critical parameter to control the thermal conductivity. Okay, so below you can see uh, the classical guideline for design of the high the phonon thermal conductivity. So we have a four criterion. So first of all, we have if the mass is a small, like light element, and if it has a hot, stronger atomic bonds, then this thing can actually enhance the group velocity, okay? 
And if the crystal structure is simple and it has a low enharmonicity, a uh, simple structure is actually related with the, the simple harmonic potential, right? So this combination is related to the phonon scattering. So this will enhance this mean free path. Okay. All right. So the fair on nearby issues uh, some list of the typical high thermal conductivity materials. On the metallic side, you can see silver, copper. Those are the most like conductive, electrically conductive material. So they have a high electron, the high thermal conductivity. For the non-metal, you can see some other material. And actually, non-metal show a much higher thermal conductivity compared to metal. Right. So silicon is also has some high thermal conductivity. We have boron nitride graphite, and eventually we have a diamond. So if you think about diamond, it really satisfies all the classical guideline. We have carbon, the light element. It has strong covalent bonds, the simple, the dia diamond structure. So diamond possesses the ultra high, the super high thermal conductivity. Right? And it was suggested that the graphene, which is a 2D, which has 2D symmetry of a carbon, it has even much higher thermal conductivity on the plane, okay? So from this classical guideline, we can design material and you can understand the high thermal conductivity in these 2D materials. All right, so at this point, let me introduce some properties of other two-dimensional materials. So uh, two-dimensional materials has an isotropic crystal structure, like layer structures. So that means they have a different conductivity along the plane and cross plane direction. So the figure on your right shows the summary of in plane and through plane conductivity. And uh, this is actually the value of uh, some large thicknesses. Okay. So here you can see the value of a graphite, and here we have the hexagonal boron nitride. Okay. So you can see these are two materials, they have very high thermal conductivity. It's, like another level compared to other material. And that is because for these two materials, their individual layer consists of really a single atom uh, thickness. If you think about other material like uh, transition metal, like glucosinase, black phosphorus, and other material, even the monolayer consists of a, at least a two or three atomic layers. So they kind of lose the perfect 2 d symmetry. So the complicated symmetry enhances the phono scattering. So they have a somewhat lower uh, in-plane thermal conductivity, right? So that's the summary. And here I like to point out that uh, in addition to the classic guideline, we have these days we can get some uh, more microscopic guideline for the phonon thermal conductivity. So one example is here. If you compare the value of tungsten disulfide and moly disulfide, uh, the tungsten has a higher thermal conductivity, even though tungsten is heavier than molybdenum. So the reason why is actually given from their phonon uh, relation. Okay? So uh, I think that's a, there may be a too much detail for this lecture. So I just like to like, uh, mentioned that we are getting some more sophisticated uh, sophisticated guideline to design the high thermal conductivity. Here, uh, but here the thing is the the specific mass ratio between the the between these two elements is really the key to suppress the overall phonon scattering. Okay, so here uh, is the two dimensional thermal conductivity of two dimensional material. So. Again, the high thermal conductivity can be realized for the actually very simple materials. Okay. And here is actually another important issue in 2D materials. So even though the graphene, the graphite, and hexagonal boron nitride, they have a high in-plane conductivity, but as I mentioned earlier in the introduction slide, we need to consider interface, and it has actually way more engineering importance for thermal management. Right. Okay, so the figure on the right shows the interface thermal conductance and versus the cross plane conductivity. Uh, this value is actually really small. Okay, 
Okay, so thermal conductance at the interface it can be described in a similar way as we define the thermal conductivity. The heat flux is proportional to the temperature difference at the interface, and material property is given as uh, G. Okay, okay. So G is a really small for the DC and isotropic material. So that suggests that even though the implant conductivity is higher, this interface conductance will will ultimately limit the heat transport out of this material. Uh, this is another extension of the kinetic acid theory. So similarly, as we described the phonon thermal conductivity, we can describe this interface conductance in the similar way. You can see similar integration, right? We have heat capacity, growth velocity, and instead of a mean free path, we have a transmission probability of phonon across that interface. So this information can explain the microscopic mechanism of interfacial thermal conductance. And as you can expect here, the description of a transmission probability is really, is really uh, challenging. Okay? So that is also an important research topic here. Uh, all right. Okay, let me talk more about the interface. So, so far I talk about the thermal conductivity of a homogeneous material. We need to consider the interface. We can apply a similar analogy from kinetic acid theory. Okay, so here we have some, some uh, important, like some uh, interface conductance for some interfaces between two materials. So the y-axis is interface conductance. The x-axis is the ratio of the elastic modulus of the two materials. So if this value is high, that means the two materials are similar in terms of the vibrational properties. If this value is small, that means they are quite different from the vibrational perspective. So what is significant here is that I just mentioned that the diamond has the super high conductivity. So, but it doesn't mean that the, just using diamond can solve all the thermal related problem. The diamond has a high conductivity, but since this is really different from other material, so their interface conductance is really low. You can see it's really low compared to other material. The interface conductance can be enhanced only for like this kind of epitaxial uh, materials, right? So designing material like that can improve the high, it can have higher interface conductance is a really important uh, research area, especially for the thermal management uh, problems. So here is a good illustration for interfacial heat transport. Uh, here we have the gallium nitride the power electronics semiconductor, right? So if you under the constant flux situation, you can see, uh, so it illustrates two different conditions using different substrate. So if we have a diamond, which has a high thermal conductivity, the temperature within the diamond is relatively flat, but we're gonna have larger temperature drop at the interface. For silicon, it has a lower con thermal conductivity. So here the slope is larger, but at the interface, the temperature difference is much smaller, okay? So not only the thermal conductivity, but also the interfacial thermal conductance are important like, engineering parameter for this kind of thermal management, okay? All right, to move on. Okay, so here let me introduce some like, research trend to search for the high thermal conductivity material. So here the left hand side is the figure that I just showed you previously, right? The metal and non-metal with the high thermal conductivity. So the problem before is that we don't really have a material that fill the gap between uh between this diamond and boron nitride. We don't have material about thermal conductivity on the order of a thousand, right? But recently, about three or four years recently, uh, people have performed great research to find the high thermal conductivity material here. So in 2018, uh, first the theory suggested that the boron arsenide, the, this compound can have a very high thermal conductivity so they, the theory first predicts thermal conductivity about this order. 
And later, it was experimentally proved that this material actually has very high thermal conductivity. So that is a great success, right? You can find a material here. And even a few years after, people find other like the possible candidates. Uh, they actually experimentally confirm the high conductivity. So here, this is the value of a hexagonal boron nitride. But if you make it as a cubic structure, then you can actually enhance the uh, actually, this is a cubic boron nitride. And if you purify isotopes, then you can further enhance the conductivity. This is only about like 70% of the diamond conductivity. So that is amazing uh, discovery. There is other like, so overall the boron compound, like boron nitride, boron arsenide, and even the boron phosphide shows a relatively high thermal conductivity. So they have a three-dimensional structure, the cubic structure like this. So it doesn't have an isotropy. So that means this material may have better interface conductance compared to 2D material. So maybe the optimization of both thermal conductivity and interfacial conductance is possible for this kind of uh, material. Okay, so there should be a problem also, right? And the problem is that this material should great property, but here are the sample that uh, have been studied. So the challenging part is actually the synthesis of this material. So these results are reported for single crystals of this compound uh, that takes about a month to grow the size of millimeter size of a crystal. So uh, there are lots of things to study. We are also studying this material, like how their thermal conductivity changes in some different microstructures and how we can develop some Synthetic method to mass produce this kind of material with high quality. Okay, okay. So still we are uh, we are finding a new materials and they may suggest a new property of thermal conductivity and interface so that we can have some uh, solution for thermal management. I hope. Okay. All right. So that is the materials part. Okay. Okay, so I have a few, uh, I have some more minutes. So let me introduce another uh, part. That, that will be the last part of my lecture, okay? So far, so to summarize, I introduced how we can describe the, describe and understand the thermal conductivity of the materials. And then I introduced the possible candidates that can have high thermal conductivity. And the next part is that now we can guess and we can make materials. And the problem is how we can characterize their properties. And for those nanoscale properties, right, we need to have appropriate characterization uh, method, right? So let me introduce our the thermometry technique that we use in, in our lab. Okay. okay, so we have a thermometry for nanoscale, which is critical to uh, for the research of thermal conductivity at the nanoscale. Uh, we have the technology that's named as a time doing thermal reflectance or TDTR in short. Okay, so TDTR is a design to study the nanoscale heat transport. So studying nanoscale means we have to have very short time scale and length scale, right? So in order to obtain those nanoscale sensitivity, we rely on this uh, ultra fast laser, laser system, okay? So here we have a laser source, the source is generating a series of laser pulses. The laser pulse is only about one picosecond. So that is like 10 to the minus 12 seconds. So that's extremely short, right? So laser pulse is observed to the sample surface like this. It creates a heating at the top. And we have another uh, laser sword, laser pulse that is a time delayed and it's investigating the temperature change induced by this the first pulse, okay? And the time delay is within the range of a nanosecond, four nanosecond. Okay, so during the time period, uh, heat is propagated into only about few micron. So we can study heat transport within this few micron near the surface. So that includes the thermal conductivity of a thin material and also the interfacial thermal conductance. Okay, so here's the key for studying the thermal transport using TDTR system. So the, the strength of a TDTR is that 
we are employing a very complicated pattern of heating. Okay, so here we have the pulse, we have pulse heating, and also the overall intensity is modulated. So this results in the complicated heating response of our sample. Okay, so this red line indicates the temperature response at the sample surface. Right, so we are probing uh, using this time delayed probe pulses, we can study, uh, we can did, uh, measure the temperature response of the sample. I will skip the details, okay? Okay, so the thing is we are applying a periodic heating in addition to the pulse heating. So that way we can distinguish the phase response of a temperature. So that way we can distinguish the response of the bulk and also response of the interfaces. Okay, and using this optical geometry, by varying this optical geometry, we can study the different direction of heat transport. If we overlap the heating and sensing pulse, then we can study heat transport along the cross-plane direction. And this has been applied to many other many materials uh, since the in since the design, the first design by Cahill in 2004, it has applied to lots of material and successfully measured thermal conductivity of the entire range of a solid material. And then the optical geometry can be uh, modified such that the beam is scanning on the surface. In this way, we can study the lateral heat transport. Uh, still, it has some limitations, okay? So for this design, we measure temperature as a function of a time delay. For this design, we measure temperature uh, at fixed time delay as a function of the lateral uh, position. All right, so that's uh, all I have for this uh, topic. Okay, so our lab is, uh, we have this TDTR technique. So we use this technique to study some various thermal transfer properties of the materials. So if you are interested in using this uh, measurement setup, we are always uh, happy to uh, have study together to explore some exciting materials. Okay, so let me summarize uh, now. Okay, so I first introduced that heat conduction can be described by uh, phenomenologically Fourier law. And the microscopic picture is given by kinetic gas theory. So these two are really the basic picture to describe the heat conduction process. So we apply this picture to solid to describe the electron and the phonon thermal conductivity. So electron is related to electrical conductivity. The phonon uh, thermal conductivity reflects a lot of the crystal property, and especially the conductivity is a result of the anhydronicity. Okay, so from this picture, you can design the guideline for your material and also to fine tune uh, your material and interfaces. Uh, all right, so that's uh, all I have for this lecture. Okay, so that's it. If you have any questions, you can speak up or you can type in the chat box. Are there any uh, questions? Hey, hey Jin, can I ask a question? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I learned a lot, okay, because, you know, uh, we have one project related to the uh, heat uh, uh, conductivity measurement in the hammer media. All right. Yeah, yeah, because now, okay. Uh, we are we we now nowadays we use the three omega measure mm, uh, to measure this one. Okay, uh, from from your measurement TDTR measure, it seems okay. We can easily to measure the outer plane and in plane uh, mm -hmm. thermal conductivities. Right. Uh, except the TDTR, do you have any idea for the others measure that can measure the okay the uh perpendicular or auto plane or in plane thermal conductivities oh i think the common like common method <clears throat> i mean there are some other techniques that have been applied particularly for 2d material like mm -hmm. 2d you need to study in plane and also the the cross plane direction and 
a common technique is, I'll say, the Raman thermometry, right? So, Raman, okay. Yeah, so the Raman peak has the frequency depends on temperature and using the peak that has the largest temperature sensitivity, you can use the Raman, you apply, you induce the heating by the laser and you collect the Raman spectrum. And by tracking the frequency position, then you can determine the temperature. Uh, and one more question, okay. Normally when you're heating, right, you have a modeling, okay. Modeling mm -hmm. is a, a semi-sphere modeling, right? It's normally it's uh, using the, uh, yeah, okay. Next one. Here. Yeah, you hear right when you hit right. You suppose there is a, uh, uh, a, a for the in-plane one, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a you assume there is a uh, this a uh, uh, semi spheric modeling, mm -hmm. right? How the transport, the thermal transport from top to the Mm -hmm. Okay, to bottom and then to okay to the lateral and the uh and the, in the outer plane. Oh, so Model. here actually, oh, I mean, I drew this like a sphere because it's difficult to draw. Uh, but this is not spherical. Uh, like coordinate. I this is based on the three. Just we use the three Cartesian, uh, the three dimensional Cartesian axis. So here we have some geometry. Yeah, of course, at the surface, the heating happens in spherical shape because of the Gaussian shape of the laser beam. And then we consider the three-dimensional the three tensor the, of thermal conductivity of this anisotropic material, right? Okay. So we solve the heat transport equation in three dimensions using x, y, and z as a variable. So do we have this modeling? Okay. Oh, do do yeah. you mind? To, okay, to share. Okay, maybe oh. later you send me. Okay, some modeling. Okay. So actually, oh. the modeling for this heat transport is uh described in this uh paper. Okay. Okay. Just uh, you know the the, the heat. We, mm -hmm. you know, because we suppose there is a pound mm -hmm. heating, right? Pound 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 heating, and mm -hmm. how the transport along the vertical and. The, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, in the lateral. We suppose it is uh, isotropic. Okay. I see. Uh, right. And then assumption as this one, because it's a, uh, if mm -hmm. there's, okay, for this one, maybe the thickness is very large. If for them, for them but the, there are a few layers, the top layers, okay, a few nanometer, 10 nanometer, and other layers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, it's different materials, and mm -hmm. also microstructure are different. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, right. so. So yeah, actually, so so we have, I think we have an analytic solution for this case. So uh, we don't solve this temperature for real, like we use a Fourier transform. So change variable to like the space and time variable change. Okay. So we solve this in Fourier of the frequency domain with also we use a different variable for the the wave vector variable for position also. So that will give you a more easier way to solve for this heat transport problem. Okay. Yeah, so those ideas are shown in the paper. Maybe I can send you some other ones, like how we can solve this. Uh, it's a really complicated problem, like heating and consider the geometry of the heating and also response of the material. Yes, yeah. So yeah, I can send you some other papers. Maybe you can discuss. After yes, that. okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I learned a lot. Yeah. Okay. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Uh, all right, I can see some questions in chat box. Okay, so you, I have a question about the interfacial thermal conductance. So we have a different uh, a property here, right? All right, so the thermal conductivity for bulk, we have a mean free path, which reflects the full noise scattering. In for the interface, we have the transmission probability. So the question is, what determines this the transmission probability? So if you think about this, maybe I actually I skip this picture here. Okay, so think about the interface between these two material, and so we have the phonon in this uh, A material state, and then it wants to move into this other material B. 
So for this phonon to be present in another material, it should have the appropriate state, right? Uh, so far, we assume the elastic scattering. So uh, in that case, we have the, so what's important is that for these two different materials, we need to have, we are expecting similar phonon properties. So the figure below shows the phonon density of states. So the, the, the black color is for the gallium nitride, the red is for diamond, blue is for the silicon. And this white area indicates the overlap region. And you can see the vibrational spectrum for gallium nitride and silicon are much more similar compared to with the diamond. So they have higher overlapping. So that means, so this illustrates the phonons can easily be present on the other side, right? So this is one of the criteria so that the two materials have a similar vibrational property, so that will that can enhance this uh, the transmission probability, right? Uh, so actually, we don't have uh, there are several like model to describe the transmission probability, but they all rely on this kind of elastic scattering. But of course, it's possible there can be some more complicated like inelastic scattering, right? In this uh, interface, right? So like further like developing more sophisticated model for this interface of transport is actually some ongoing uh, research topic. Okay, I have another uh, question. Those questions are from my students. Okay, let's so explain why the sample should be larger than 100 nanometer thickness. Okay, so the question is that for in-plane thermal conductivity measurement, we have some uh, restrictions. Okay, so for the in-plane, uh, okay, so here's a different thing. So through-plane conductivity measures the, the cooling of the top surface, right? It shows, it's kind of a tracking the cooling of the top surface. The in-plane conductivity measures distribution of heat on the surface, right? And this kind of a distribution can happen, can be, uh, it can come from both the metallic layer and the layer below, right? I think I forgot to mention that we have a metallic layer that serves as a heater and a thermometer, okay? So anyway, we have a metallic layer at the top, okay? So we want to measure in-plane heat conduction in this layer below. So that means this lateral heat uh, propagation should be dominated by the response of our material, okay? So if this material is too thin, then this lateral distribution will be negligible compared to the response of the metal. So that way we cannot determine the response of this material, okay? So that's why we need to have a kind of a thicker sample to determine the in-point uh, thermal conductivity. Okay. Okay, so there is another uh, question. So I provide a guideline for good thermal conductance. Okay, so the question is about the guideline for the uh, thermal conductivity. Okay, uh, so these guidelines are actually related to the microscopic picture of thermal conductivity, okay? So in order to have a higher phonon thermal conductivity, we need to have high heat capacity, velocity, and mean free path. The heat capacity is actually uh, determined by the number density, the atomic density, the number density of your material. The velocity, so this is not uh, what we can easily uh, change, and it also doesn't change that much depending on material. Uh, in terms of a velocity, uh, I think this is maybe a too uh, detailed, but if you go back to the definition of a velocity, this is related to the frequency and the wave vector. And of this frequency, uh, one another guideline is given by the harmonic oscillator. Okay, so in this harmonic oscillator, if you have, if you want to have the higher frequency, the, the spring should have a higher constant and the mass should be small, then you can have a higher uh, frequency. Okay, so the, 
the large spring constant corresponds to the stronger atomic bonding and smaller mass corresponds to the smaller atomic mass. So that means the lighter element, right? So those are two criteria here. Low atomic mass, stronger bonding contributes to higher uh, velocity. And the mean free path I mentioned, the phonon scattering is a result of anharmonicity of the potential. So that requires a simple structure and a low uh, anharmonicity, okay? Okay, so I believe I answer to all of the questions. Okay, so time's almost up. Are there any other uh, questions? Uh, if you have any other questions, you can feel free to send me email uh, and also discuss with our student in my lab. Okay, so that's uh, everything I have for today's lecture. So thank you everyone for attending the lecture. Uh, and